So we're going to um, take a look at hedge funds uh, and we're going to start by comparing hedge funds uh, against mutual funds because we want to see the distinction behind them and the key word behind both is funds. They're both funds. Uh, they're both pools of capital. Investors pool their capital and there's one fund that goes and invests. Uh, that's where uh, the similarities end. Uh, after that they're, they're um, very distinct. So let's have a, a look at them and we'll go down the column for hedge funds uh, because I think we have a good grasp on what mutual funds are, but we'll contrast them with mutual funds at each point. For hedge funds, no restrictions on short positions. Uh, mutual funds really can't go short. Now, when I say they really can't go short, there are some conditions under which they could go short if they get permission. We don't need to go into detail about it, but let's just say that there are, there are huge restrictions on mutual funds using short selling. Hedge funds, no restriction. Uh, hedge funds can use derivatives in any way they want. Uh, mutual funds, very limited use of derivatives. Uh, hedge funds are generally sold by offering memorandums to sophisticated or accredited investors only, whereas the mutual fund is sold to the general public by prospectus. Let me write that word down so you see the difference. This is by prospectus. Uh, and this is by offering memorandum. Offering memorandums are typically for private placements. They don't have to do the full prospectus. Uh, as private offerings, uh, uh, they are subject to less regulation. Mutual funds, huge amounts of regulation because if you're taking money from the general public, they need to be protected. Here, these are sophisticated investors, accredited investors. They can protect themselves, so less regulation. Um, hedge funds charge management fees and in most cases performance fees. Now this is the same with mutual funds. Mutual funds have a management fee, but the performance fee is a percentage of the gain. So you might have a, 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 a fund that is a, called a 2 and 20, a 2% two, two and 20%. The management fee is 2% no matter what the fund does, and it's 20% of the upside. So if the fund returns 10%, the hedge fund managers get another 2%, 20% of that 10%. Absolute return objective. In other words, their benchmark is 0%. They look to beat 0% in all markets. Now you may say, but that's the same for a mutual fund. Mutual fund is relative return, which means if the market is down 10%, all a mutual fund wants to do is be down 8%. It just wants to beat the market. It doesn't care about the zero. It cares about the benchmark. Uh, hedge funds care about zero. Zero is the low end. They don't want negative returns. They're not trying to beat any particular benchmark. Their benchmark is zero. They're trying to beat that all the time. Absolute return objective. Uh, most are valued monthly versus uh, uh, mutual funds uh, valued daily. Annual disclosure to unit holders here in mutual funds, quarterly uh, or annual disclosure to unit holders. And a hedge fund can take a very concentrated position. Mutual funds have limitations, typically less than 10% in any one issuer. Uh, less than 20% in any one particular industry. A hedge fund can take uh, 80, uh, up to 90% of its assets in one particular, uh, in one particular uh, security or one particular bet. So we can have very concentrated positions. All right, let's look at a few of those uh, details just in, in a little bit more depth here. Hedge fund investments typically do not require the issuance of a prospectus. This is if you want to raise money from the general public. Um, one of the uh, uh, trade-offs for this, they don't have to issue a prospectus, uh, is they can only uh, accept accredited investors only. And accredited investors are those who have net financial assets greater than a million. Let me underline a key word here, financial assets. Not total assets, financial assets greater than a million or net income greater than 200,000 in the last two years. Uh, if the person is married, part of a family unit, then the household income must be greater than 300000 over the last two years. Uh, they also cannot advertise. A mutual fund can advertise. A highly regulated, can take money from the general public, can advertise. Hedge funds cannot advertise. Uh, so there's a, another limitation there. Uh, say, and there may also be a sale of a minimum investment issued by private placement, offering memorandum instead of a prospectus. That's a big difference between the two. Uh, funds uh, targeting high net worth individuals or institutional uh, investors. This is uh, the hedge, hedge fund side. There, there are hedge fund 
there's hedge fund exposure for retail investors. Here we're just going to look at the high net worth individuals or institutional investors, typically set up as a partnership. All the investors are limited partners, and the general partner is the uh, is the uh, fund manager. Typically, the general partner will have five percent of the value of the fund of their own money invested. Mutual fund managers don't put their own money into the mutual fund, but it is expected that the hedge fund manager will put their money on the line. So if it's a $100 million fund that they're trying to raise, it's expected that the whoever the general partners are will put up $5 million of their own money and they'll raise $95 million from the limited partners. Uh, and the general uh, partners have the day-to-day -day management. These are the hedge fund managers. And again, 5%. So if they're raising a billion dollar, if they're going to put together a billion dollar fund, they need to put up 50 million of their own money. Let's look at some benefits and risks to uh, hedge fund investing. Number one, low correlation with traditional asset classes. So you get diversification benefits. Uh, low standard deviation of returns. So you actually get lower risk out of a, uh, out of a hedge fund. Absolute returns in up or down markets, at least that's the goal, is that they do strive for absolute return. Lower volatility, which is what we have here, lower volatility, plus higher returns means you get a higher sharp ratio. So they can actually achieve higher sharp ratios than you could normally get in a mutual fund. Now, why would that be? Well, is because a hedge fund has a lot more flexibility in being able to protect itself. It can go short. It can use derivatives to shift risk. Uh, it can uh, use leverage in good times. It can really push its winnings. Uh, so because it has a lot more tools that it can use, uh, it can manage its risk better and squeeze out a higher return at a lower volatility. Uh, so that's what's uh, appealing about the returns for, uh, for hedge funds. <clears throat> Risks, lightly regulated. Uh, so there's a lack of transparency, sometimes even a lack of governance over what hedge funds are doing inside. Manager risk, more so than in, in, in other managed products, the hedge fund is only as good as the person running it. Uh, whereas with a mutual fund, uh, uh, the family of mutual funds tends to, tends to have a stable of portfolio managers that, it's, that it tends to use as opposed to just one big star name. But a hedge fund is usually... Uh, behind every hedge fund is usually a star name, one big person. Complex investment strategies. Yes, they are. Uh, but uh, I never see this as a disadvantage or a risk. Sure, they're complex, but I don't have to know them. Uh, brain surgery is complex, but I don't have to know it. Somebody else knows it. So if I'm uh, dealing with a brain surgeon, I just have to say, look, I don't get it, but you do. So, yeah, we may not get the strategies, but they do. Liquidity constraints. This is a big one. Uh, you don't have this in mutual funds. Mutual funds, you, you have the right of redemption at net asset value. Uh, but with uh, hedge funds, you do not have the right of redemption. It's more of a privilege. Uh, there, are, there can be lockup periods. This is a, the initial investments cannot be redeemed during lockup period. So when you put your money into a hedge fund, there might be a six month or a one year lockup period, which says you simply can't have it back. Never mind about a penalty for withdrawing early. You simply can't we withdraw early. Uh, redemption dates. Redemption can occur on specified dates only. Typically, it's quarterly. For a mutual fund, if I want out on January 22nd and I place my order before the cutoff time that day, at the end of the day, I get redeemed. Uh, for a hedge fund, it's usually quarterly at the end of the quarter, which means if I say on January 22nd, I want out, on March 31st, I'll get my money. So it's, it might be quarterly, it might be semi-annually. Uh, redemption suspension. If the markets are uh, not doing very well, and I've got positions that aren't performing as well as they could be performing, but they will because they're derivative-based, and they will perform, it's just, I just need time, I can suspend all redemptions. I can say, look, nobody gets their money back. Because if I got to give somebody their money back, it means I have to unwind this position. And if I unwind this position, I got to take losses, which will hurt everyone. So to protect everyone, no one's going to get their money back for now. Continuing on with the risks, incentive fees. And that may not sound like a risk. That just may sound like a cost. But I'll, I'll at the end, once I explain everything, I'll explain why this tends to be a, uh, a risk. 
The incentive fee is the gross return minus any management or admin fees. Now that's paid regardless. You've got to pay the management fee. So let's say uh, the return was 10%, the management fee was 2%, 10 minus 2 is 8%, multiply by 20%. That's the incentive fee. The, the hedge fund managers get 20% of the upside, uh, typically. Uh, and we usually call these funds 2 and 20s. A 2 and 20 fund means the management fee is 2% and the uh, incentive fee is 20%. For a really star performer uh, in the hedge fund industry, somebody who's got incredibly great returns and an incredibly great track record, they can go to 3 and 30 uh, which means they get a 3% management fee and 30% of the upside. Some, uh, uh, some funds will have something called a high water mark and a hurdle rate uh, before the incentive fees kick in. So let's deal with the high water mark first. Let's say that uh, at the beginning of the year, the net asset value per share for the hedge fund is $10, and uh, by the end of the second year, it hits a high of $12. Uh, but in year three, it falls back to $10. In year three, the incentive fee only applies on the net asset value per share greater than 12. Simply because the management has taken 20% of the upside all the way to 12, it fell back to 10. If it then went from 10 to 12, the reason, the thinking is, look, you've already been paid up to 12, now it fell down to 10, and you're going to make bring it back up to 12 and get paid again. No, no, no. You, your incentive fee, your 20% kicks in only after you get the net asset value per share above the high water mark. Uh, so in year three, since it fell, there'd be no incentive fee. In year four, if they got the share back to $12 uh, per share, uh, there still is no incentive fee because it only kicks in above the high water mark. There may also be a hurdle rate, and a hurdle rate is a minimum return needed before the incentive fee. So let's look at an example so we can keep it all straight. Let's say that we have a fund that has a 20% incentive fee and a 2% management fee. There's our 2 and 20 fund with a 6% hurdle rate and it made a 15% return. The first thing that gets taken off the return is the management fee. That 2% gets paid every year no matter what, so there's 13%. Uh, but the hurdle rate is 6%. That go, the first 6% go to investors, period. Management gets nothing of that first 6%. That's why it's called a hurdle rate. So 13% uh, less the hurdle rate is only 7% left. Then they get 20% of the 7% or another 1.4 as their incentive fee. So their total fee is the 2% management fee, the 1.4% uh, incentive fee. They get a 3.4% uh, uh, take out of the 15%. So that's combining a, uh, a hurdle rate with the incentive fee with the management fee. Now, if there was a high watermark, the first thing we would do is say, are we above the highest value we've ever been before? And if we are not above the highest value, then all of this is off the table. The, the incentive fee is gone, but the management fee still stays, but the incentive fee is gone. So we're still on our risks. Um, let me explain, uh, I said I would explain why the uh, why all those uh, incentive fees, hurdle rates and all that were, were risks. Here's what typically happens. If a fund uh, drops below its high watermark significantly enough, and the managers of the hedge fund say it'll be three, four years before we get back to the high water mark. So we're not going to get any incentive fees for the next three or four years. What they'll typically do is shut down the fund and reopen another one somewhere else. So if they get too far below the high water mark, um, they simply just shut down the fund. That's the risk uh, of having uh, all of those, uh, all of now. It sounds great. Well, there's a high water mark, which for the investor, that sounds like a rational thing. But you have the other side, the manager, that if it gets too far under, they'll just shut it down. So the risk to you is like, well, uh, yeah, I, I get it. There's a high water mark, but at some point, you're not going to want to try to get it back above that level. So tax implications, uh, far more complex than a mutual fund or a seg fund because there may be something called a carried interest in here. And we don't need to get into that. We just have to know that it's a lot more complex than it is at a mutual fund. Uh, short selling and leverage, well, that's a risk because it magnifies losses. And short selling, there is the, the potential for your losses to be greater than the original investment. And because it's structured as a, uh, a partnership, the general partners would be responsible for that. The limited partners wouldn't, but the general partners would be. Business risk, a hedge fund, in the end, is still a business. It employs people, it has bills, it has debts, it has to pay those. Well, let's, uh, let's begin our review here of segregated funds. Uh, everything that you know about pooled investments, all of the benefits that you know about pooled investments, take that with you. Now add an insurance contract to that. 
So take the two and combine them, you have a segregated fund. Ultimately, it is an insurance contract. It's an insurance contract known as an individual variable insurance contract. And since you have an insurance company that is a party to the contract, it is thus regulated by provincial insurance regulators. Three regulatory bodies here we should be aware of. Number one, each province has accepted the Canadian Life and Health Insurance Association's guidelines as the primary regulatory requirements. Federal insurance regulators do not regulate the sale of, of uh, uh, segregated funds. Number two, OSFI. This is the Office of the Superintendent of Financial Institutions only ensures that insurance companies have adequate capitalization. And finally, number three, Assurus. This is like CDIC, but for insurance companies. Uh, so they cover uh, loss due to insolvency of the companies, not loss due to um, bad performance of any of the assets. Covers only the death benefit and the maturity guarantee in a seg fund contract up to $60,000 or 85% of the guarantee amounts, and it is the higher of the two. As we go deeper, we're going to look at some unique features uh, of, the, uh, of a segregated fund. Again, remember I said take, take the pooled investment and all of the benefits we have behind pooled investment, and let's add some of these. Maturity protection, death benefits, and creditor protection. This flows out of the fact that you have insurance combined with a pool investment. All right, let's look at the structure of a segregated fund. Here's where we have to think a little bit because it is, uh, it is different from a mutual fund. When we give money to a mutual fund, we get um, units in return. Units represent our ownership claim on the pooled fund. We own something. Not so with a segregated fund. When we give money to the insurance company, it is not our money anymore. We've given it to the insurance company. They're not our assets. They are the assets of the insurance company. So we can't get units in return because that would signify an ownership claim. However, we should be able to track the performance of our investment. Well, I, let's call it an investment very lightly, but you get what I'm saying here. We need to track the performance of that particular investment. So instead of getting units, um, investors are assigned notional units. And a notional unit is, look, if we were to give you units, this is how many there would be. But let's be clear, there are no units. But if there were, they'd look like this. Wink, wink. Uh, so there are no shares or units. Investors are assigned notional units so that they can track their benefits and they compare the performance with mutual funds. Let's look at the parties to a contract. You have a contract holder. This is the person who bought the contract, uh, a, and a segregated fund can be held in a registered plan. If it's held in a registered plan, the contract holder is the annuitant. We'll get to the annuitant here next. The annuitant is the person who is insured. The contract holder must have an insurable interest in that person. So I can be the contract holder, and I can have a policy on myself. I'm the annuitant, and I can hold it in, a, in, in my RSP. So that when I do uh, uh, pass on, uh, the insurance company would make the payment directly into uh, my estate. I could be the contract holder and my son could be the annuitant. Uh, and uh, uh, I have an insurable interest in that particular person. Or it could be my wife or it could be anybody in my family. But what I cannot do is I can't just walk across the street, open your mailbox, look at the, the name on, on the envelope and say, that's who I'm going to insure, this person. I've seen them eating fast food all the time, coming home drunk at night, smoking cigarettes. I'm insuring this person. You can't do that. I have no insurable interest in that person. Not only that, think about how you would feel if someone came along and introduced themselves and says, by the way, I took out a big life insurance policy on you. You did what? So uh, you must have an insurable interest in the person. And then you have a beneficiary. There's the third person of the contract, the person who receives the benefit upon death. It can be one. It can be, uh, uh, sorry, one or more individuals. It can be a state or it can be a charity. Uh, there can be a revocable designation or an irrevocable designation in terms of the beneficiary. A revocable designation says, look, I'm going to name this person, but I retain the right to say, you know what, I've changed my mind. The contract holder can change the beneficiary. There is an irrevocable designation. Here, I would need the beneficiary's consent to change. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute. This seems like it offers the most flexibility, a revocable designation. Why would you ever give an irrevocable designation when you can give a revocable designation? 
Let us say that you are at a certain age where you are facing an illness you know that will compromise your ability to make decisions and you don't want to be vulnerable. At that point, you would pick a family member and you say, okay, well, let's make it irrevocable so when I get into a situation where I cannot distinguish what's going on, I cannot be tricked at that time. I cannot be led away from the original decision that I want, then you would make it an irrevocable designation. All right, let's uh, jump into some of these features we mentioned a little earlier. A, the maturity guarantee. Legislation requires a minimum, so there is a minimum amount here, 75% guarantee of the amount invested over a contract term of at least 10 years. So this is important now. A minimum of 75% and you have a contract term of at least 10 years or death. I know that's a harsh word, but we should get comfortable with it. Uh, at least 10 years or death. Most will offer 100%. It's a competitive marketplace out there, so you got to match what the competition is doing and you'll be at a disadvantage. Most offer 100%, but with a little bit of catch here. Uh, longer term to maturity instead of 10 years, 15 years. Higher management expense ratios because you are getting um, uh, more benefit out of it. However, in doing so, they may impose an age restriction. For example, no older than 80 at contract start. This is the big thing here, reset dates. Let's see how these things work. Resets can be daily to annually. They lock in higher market values. Resets will start the 10-year clock uh, time to maturity over again. And we'll just go with the 10-year. Let's not uh, say that the, we negotiate a longer term to maturity. We'll just go with uh, what legislation requires at least 10 years. Here's how it works. Let's say on January 4th, um, I make a, 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 a contribution of $10,000. There's my investment into the segregated fund. Uh, there's a market value of $10,000 on day one. My maturity guarantee, let's say it's 100%, is for $10,000. And my maturity date is January 4th, 27. In other words, to get the guarantee, I must hold it to that date. There must be a 10-year holding period for me to lock in that guarantee. It's not a guarantee until that happens. Then I'm guaranteed that amount. January 5th, the market value of the investment is now $9,900. My maturity guarantee is still $10,000. My maturity date is still January 4th, 2027. January 6th, the market value is 10,125. I say, you know what? Let's lock that in. So I say, let's lock that in. So we'll reset my maturity guarantee at that amount, 10,125. But look what happens. It starts the 10 year clock over again. Now, my maturity date is January 6th, 2027. So if you go five years into this, and the market is up, let's say, 30% over that period of time, and you decide to lock in the, that, that gain, you'll get that maturity guarantee. But it starts your 10-year clock over again, so you don't just have five years to the new maturity date, you have 10 years to the maturity date before that guarantee becomes valid. So you can always reset at higher and higher market rates, but when you reset, you keep pushing uh, uh, that, uh, that, that maturity date further down the calendar. All right, let's take a look at our uh, second feature uh, that, ins that the insurance contract brought to our pooled investment here, death benefits. Uh, and this is the maturity guarantee minus any net asset value. If that is greater than zero, we have a death benefit. Uh, so we can see where the death benefit would kick in is where the market value of our investment is lower than the maturity guarantee. So let's look at some examples here. The guaranteed amount, let's say it was $10,000. And we're going to look at uh, a number of scenarios. But let's just jump all the way to the last column first. Look at the total amount paid to the beneficiary. In all cases, it's $10,000 or more. It's never below $10,000. So let's see how this uh, fits in. Let's say the market value at death was $8,000. Well, we have a guaranteed amount of 10,000. The insurance company would liquidate this, come up with 8,000. They'd have to kick in 2,000 of their own. That's called the death benefit. Total amount paid to beneficiary, 10,000. If the market value at death was 9,000, well, they got to make good on 10,000, so they got to come up with 1,000, right? So the total amount paid to beneficiary is, I think you see the trend going on here, 10,000. If the market value at death was 10,000, well, then the insurance company is not on the hook for anything. They simply just sell the assets. They sell the assets. Keep in mind now, this $10,000 came from the client, the contract holder to begin with. This wasn't the insurance company's money. So they're not out anything. Uh, and the total amount paid to the beneficiary, $10,000. Here's, uh, here's the nice part. Um, let's say that the market value of death was 11000 
the maturity guarantee, the guaranteed amount was $10,000, but it's worth more. Well, there still is no death benefit, but the beneficiary gets it all. They get 11000 So it's not as if they just get the 10000 no matter what the fund does. They'll get the minimum of 10000 or the market value of the assets, whichever is higher. Finally, creditor protection, our third feature here. Since this is insurance, um, the, uh, the assets are not assets of the individual. When I give $10,000 to an insurance company for a segregated fund, that's no longer my money. That money now belongs to the insurance company. The assets it buys uh, belong to the insurance company. The insurance company has a contingent liability, that being my death, where they would have to pay out a certain amount that they guaranteed. That's the insurance part of it. But they're not my assets. So if I get sued and I lose it all, they can't touch it. It's, they're not my assets. But uh, the fund must have been set up in good faith. That means that I, I, I did not set up the fund specifically to avoid creditors, not for the purpose of avoiding creditor action, and not within the last year. If it was uh, done within the last year from the time where I say, that's it, I give up, I'm bankrupt. If I did this within that period of time, the courts can call that back and not while I'm insolvent. The courts can call that back as well. And I must name a beneficiary and not the estate. And I think you can see why you can't name the estate. If there's a claim against me, there's a claim against everything I own, including my estate. And if I and the beneficiary is my estate, well, then creditor protection seems to be uh, uh, sort of nullified in that case, right? So you must name a beneficiary. Uh, another uh, nice feature uh, uh, of it being insurance is bypassing probate. Because they're not assets of the estate, well, you don't have to go through probate. It avoids the probate fees, avoids estate disputes. There is no waiting. The insurance company pays out right away. Assets are not part of the estate. Let's move on to uh, the taxation of segregated funds. You'll notice that I, I write it uh, in short form, seg funds, and often you'll hear it um, mentioned that way uh, in practice, uh, shortened to just seg funds. So if you hear the term seg funds, you know they're talking about segregated funds. And honestly, if you ask me uh, uh, my opinion, seg funds is a lot more fun to say than segregated funds. Try it yourself. You'll see seg funds, seg funds. That's fun to say. All right, let's have a look at how they're taxed. They're taxed like trusts, which means the income flows through to the contract holder. Okay, now look up and think about that for a second. Didn't we just say that the assets belong to the insurance company? That they no longer belong to the contract holder? How is it possible that the insurance company gets to own the assets, but all of the income, they get somebody else to pay for all the tax on that income? Well, that's just the way it is. The income flows through to the contract holder in the form that it is earned. And this is a process called allocation. So dividends, interest, capital gains, they flow through to the contract holder. So if the segregated fund is not held in a registered account, the contract holder has an annual obligation to claim the income from the fund and pay tax on it every year without receiving the money for it. And the allocation is based on the number of units held. Well, let's be clear now, the number of notional units held. Let's not cross that line, right? Number of notional units held and the proportion of the year. So we can see that it is time-weighted there. For a mutual fund, the net asset value per unit falls on distributions but the holders have more units. For a SEG fund, the net asset value per unit does not fall. The income is allocated to existing contract holders, yes, but it's held in the account. It's allocated to you, but you don't actually get it. So the insurance company owns the assets. It makes money on, that, on those assets. It holds on to that money and just tells you, oh, by the way, do you mind picking up our tax bill for us? That's just something you have to know about SEG funds is you still have to pay the tax on it if it's not held in a registered account. Here's a nice thing, though. Any capital losses that the segregated fund uh, has can be passed on to the contract holder as well. Not so in a mutual fund. They must hold on to those capital losses and then use them against any future capital gains they have. So if they're sitting on capital losses, well, they just don't get used uh, in that particular year. Whereas with the segregated fund, they're very efficient at that. Let's look at the uh, tax treatment for uh, the guarantee and the death benefit. Uh, for the guarantee, 
And let's look at a case where the contract proceeds are less than a guarantee. And we're going to assume for simplicity uh, that uh, uh, the, uh, the guarantee is 100% of the original investment, just to make it simple. And on the previous screen, we gave an example where uh, the market value of the assets were 8,000, the guarantee uh, was 10,000. Um, well, how do we deal with this? You're gonna have a uh, capital loss uh, on this because you gave $10,000, it's now only worth eight. You'll get eight back from the market value. You got a capital loss. But when you get the, uh, uh, the lift up to the 10,000, the extra 2,000, that's taxable gain. They'll offset each other to zero, but you still must report two line items, but they'll still offset each other. If I have a situation where the contract proceeds are greater than the guarantee, so let's say the contract uh, grew to $11,000 and originally it was $10,000, well, that $1,000 has got to be uh, has got to be claimed. Somebody's got to pay tax on it. That is a taxable capital gain. The death benefit. When the annuitant dies, this is the person whose life was insured. Now, when the annuitant dies, the beneficiary receives the funds, the market value of whatever the funds are, plus any death benefits if there are any tax-free. All right, we're still on uh, the tax treatment of the death benefit here. Uh, on the last screen, we ended uh, with uh, if the annuitant, uh, sorry, when the annuitant dies, uh, the beneficiary receives the funds tax-free. Now, let's move up the chain. If the contract holder dies and the annuitant is still uh, uh, around, so the contract holder dies and is not the annuitant, it is a deemed disposition at fair market value unless the spouse is named as a successor. And a deemed disposition at fair market value, whatever the gain is there, would be in the final or the terminal tax return uh, for uh, the contract holder. Again, unless the spouse is named as a successor, then uh, there is no deemed disposition. If the contract holder dies and is the annuitant, the gain or loss is reflected in the terminal tax return. Labor-sponsored ventured capital. This almost disappeared for a while. The tax, uh, the favorable tax treatment uh, on it uh, uh, had uh, sort of disappeared for a while. It has recently been reinstated. Uh, it's managed, uh, uh, managed investment funds sponsored by labor organizations. They provide capital to small and medium or small to medium emerging companies. Advantages of labor-sponsored venture capital. This is the big one, the federal tax credit for investors. And there might even be a provincial tax credit. Ontario, there isn't, but other provinces, there may be a provincial tax credit. Up to 15% uh, on a maximum amount of 5,000 invested in any one year. So if I put $5,000 into a, uh, a sponsored, labor-sponsored uh, VC fund, uh, I can get a $750 tax credit. Uh, so really, I'm investing $4,250 uh, after my tax uh, credit uh, to buy $5,000 worth of the fund. So there's sort of a, a gain right there. But uh, this is very illiquid stuff, long holding periods. I think it's, uh, uh, I think I've written it in here. Yeah, there's eight years. It's an eight year uh, holding period to avoid having to repay back that tax credit. So you get this tax credit, but now you're in for eight years. Uh, many are uh, registered account eligible. So this is where the power of this lies. If they're registered account eligible, contribution tax shelter plus tax, uh, 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 sorry, plus tax credit. So let's say that I have a 35% uh, 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 tax bracket, or well, let's go to a 40% tax bracket because this is not for low income people. This is more for uh, uh, people who can uh, absorb the high level of risk that these are. And I put $5,000 uh, into this inside my RSP. Well, I'm going to get a 40% tax savings uh, right away on the $5,000 that I put in. So I'm going to save $2,000 on my tax bill that year. Well, I'll defer that $2,000 to when I take it back out, but I'm going to save $2,000 on my tax bill. Combine it with the $750, uh, basically I'll get a credit uh, or a reduction in my taxes this year of $2,750. So I'm really out of pocket $2,250. I put $5,000 into a fund of which I own $5,000 worth of value, and I'm only out of pocket $2,250 after my tax advantages. So that's kind of nice in that sense. Disadvantages here, it's high risk. It's a speculative investment. Uh, must be held for eight years to, to avoid uh, the recapture of that tax credit, and you got higher management expenses because there's a lot more management effort that goes into picking and choosing winners into venture capital financing than there is in already publicly traded securities.
we will discuss closed end funds. Um, these are like a mutual fund uh, in the sense that they are pooled investment funds. They do have a specific uh, investment mandate. Uh, the management fee is lower than a comparable mutual fund though. Uh, the thing that sets it apart, while a mutual fund can continually uh, uh, issue new units or new shares, there's a fixed or limited number of shares for an open-ended fund. Here's the big thing, listed on an exchange. You don't have to wait till the end of the day uh, to determine a price for your shares. You can sell them on the exchange at any time of the day. Uh, therefore, the price is based on supply and demand for the shares and the net asset value per share. Typically, closed-end funds will trade at a discount to net asset value, which is nice on the way in, maybe not so nice on the way out. But we're introducing a new thing in the price, which is the supply and demand for the shares. For a mutual fund, supply and demand for the units or the shares has no effect on the net asset value per share. That's what you get. But here, uh, with closed-end funds, you run into a situation where a closed-end fund may trade for less than its net asset value, may trade at par with its net asset value, or may even trade at a premium to its net asset value per share. Uh, if the fund can buy back its own shares on the open market, it's referred to as an interval fund or a closed-end discretionary fund. Advantages of closed-end funds. More flexible than mutual funds, you can actually short sell uh, a closed-end fund. If it's listed on the exchange, you can short sell it. But you can't short sell a mutual fund. Um, no liquidity regulation. Therefore, it's more fully invested. Well, what does that mean? Remember now, a mutual fund has to keep a certain amount of cash on hand to meet liquidity requirements. If there's redemptions during the day, the mutual fund must pay it out, so it has to sit on cash. About 5% of its assets are cash. A closed-end fund can put 100% of its money to work. It doesn't have to sit on cash. So it, has that, it does not have that liquidity regulation. It may trade at a premium to net asset value per share. So if you buy your closed-end funds at a discount and wait until they trade at a premium, Ah, a little bit of a bump there. Lower management expense ratios and minute-to-minute -minute pricing. Disadvantages, well, they may trade at a discount. So if you buy them at a premium and you want to get out and they're trading at a discount, well, you either take the hit or you wait. Uh, maybe less liquid than a mutual fund. Now, you may think, but if they trade on the exchange, shouldn't they be more liquid? Well, here's the thing with the mutual fund. You're going to get it. You, If you want to redeem your shares, it's a done deal. You, you don't have to wait for there to be a, a buyer of the shares when you want to redeem them. It goes right to the mutual fund. But on a closed-end fund, if the volume of shares each day is very low, you might not be able to get the full uh, uh, full amount that you want to buy or the full amount that you want to sell and without significantly moving the price. And if they're traded on exchange, of course, you know you pay a trading commission when you buy and you pay a trading commission when you sell. Let's look at income trusts. And if we're familiar with the structure of a mutual fund uh, setting up as a trust, the income trust is sort of the same thing. Uh, so there is a trust. Investors will own units in the trust. These units are exchange traded so that they are traded on the exchange, much like a closed end fund would be. They're traded on exchange, so disclosure rules will apply for, uh, um, for investment trusts. The trust now owns one of two different types of assets. It can own the operating assets of a company, in which case it's referred to as a business income trust. And the types of business it would typically own are stable businesses that have little growth that are really just cash generators. Or it can own income producing real estate. And these are referred to as REITs, R-E-I-T, real estate investment trusts. And the types of properties that it could focus on are industrial properties, office or retail, apartment or residential properties. So let's uh, dig into this REIT uh, a little bit more, the Real Estate Investment Trust. And these are fantastic to hold in registered accounts. And uh, when I get to the tax level, uh, we'll see why this is such a great investment in a, a registered account. Uh, they are interest rate sensitive, like fixed income, because they rely heavily on the cash flow. Uh, REITs pay out most of their earnings as dividends. This is why we own REITs, because they've got these big, fat dividends. But since the valuation 
of REITs are really based on interest rate levels because the underlying is property and property is very interest rate uh, uh, sensitive in terms of its valuation. The price of the REIT that we're carrying will price like a fixed income security. So as interest rates go down, the value of REITs tend to go up and as interest rates go up, the value of REITs tend to come down. Not to the same extent as fixed income would, but they are sensitive to the interest rate. Uh, must pay out the majority of net income to shareholders to continue to have the trust status. As, a, as an income trust, they must pay out the majority of net income. Now, let's be clear, this is net income. It's not cash flow, it's net income. Real estate companies have huge depreciation charges. Well, depreciation is a non-cash charge. So to meet a 90% or a 95% payout ratio on net income is not difficult for a REIT because their cash flow tends to be much bigger than their net income. There is no tax at the REIT level if they meet that, uh, uh, that requirement of paying out uh, a certain amount of their net income. Typically, it's 90% to 95%. The REIT pays no tax. So all the income flows through to the uh, to the unit holders now if it's held in a registered plan there is no tax at the individual level and to make no lifetime tax hold it in a tfsa which is a tax-free a tax-free savings account that's tax-free so if you hold REITs in a tax-free savings account all the money that it makes it doesn't pay tax on it gives it to you once it arrives in your tfsa you pay no tax on that either it is 100 percent tax-free from source to account. That's a beautiful investment to hold in a TFSA. Holding it outside of a TFSA is a problem. Well, I shouldn't say outside of a TFSA. Outside of a registered account, it's a problem. Here's why. There is no tax at the REIT level. So it is a non-taxpaying Canadian corporation. And since it's a non-taxable Canadian entity, it does not qualify for the Canadian dividend tax credit, which means when you get a dividend from a REIT, and that REIT is not held in a registered account, it's the same as making interest income. It is taxed at your marginal rate of interest. There is no benefit on that dividend whatsoever, which is why you want to focus these things inside registered plans. The uh, Real Estate Investment Trust may be either open-ended or closed-ended. Open-ended means it, it can continually issue new units. Closed-ended means there's a certain number of shares in the float, and that's it. Uh, typical types of properties that you'd see uh, that income, uh, sorry, real estate investment trusts would focus on shopping centers, uh, office buildings in Canada. The uh, the big office building one that I can think of off the top of my head is Dream Office Properties. Uh, multifamily residential here, uh, Northview uh, apartment REITs. Uh, their ticker is N uh, N V U. Uh, .un if you're typing it into uh, your trading platform. Uh, that's, uh, uh, I think they're the second or third largest apartment REIT uh, in Canada. They own the uh, high-rise apartment buildings. Uh, senior housing is another thing. You can uh, think of uh, almost anything uh, in terms of property. Industrial parks, same thing. They're, they're uh, great assets for real estate investment trusts. And we'll look at the business trust category. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this. This is actually a dead issue in Canada. Uh, business trusts, there, there can be no new business trusts. There can be new real estate investment trusts, uh, but business trusts, they're gone. Uh, the federal government uh, back in 2007, I believe it was, under the PCs, believed that uh, far too many businesses were using the business trust uh, form to avoid paying their fair share of taxes, and that's gone. Uh, usually for companies with strong, stable earnings, but little growth. Uh, storage facilities, fitness centers, restaurant chains, things like that. They are still, there are still income trusts in Canada. I believe your big one for restaurant chains is A&W. Uh, I think it's still a, uh, a business trust. I'm not sure. There was a date at which all business trusts lost their status. Uh, why do we bring it up if, if this is sort of a dead issue in Canada? It's because you can't just take a Canadian perspective on, on stocks, you have to take a global perspective, and these exist uh, in, in large enough number in the U.S. that you should be aware of them. Let's have a look at listed private equity. And it almost may sound like uh, an oxymoron, right? How can something be private uh, and public at the same time? Because anything listed is public. So this is basically saying this is public-private equity. Uh, the company itself is called a private equity company. It invests in private businesses. 
uh, and it may have publicly traded shares. Unlike a mutual fund, which is uh, uh, which invests its money in publicly traded companies, we have a PE company, which would invest in it can invest in either publicly traded companies, oftentimes to take them private, or can invest directly in private companies, which is why it's called private. Uh, equity. Investors buy shares in the PE company and the PE company can invest in either publicly traded companies to take them private or directly in private companies. The shares are listed on an exchange. Let's look at some uh, of the investments that uh, private equity would typically make. Leveraged buyouts. Uh, the use of equity plus five times to ten times debt uh, to take public companies private. Uh, growth capital. Eh, venture capital. You have a venture capital firm. Well, that's private equity. Uh, turnaround. Uh, they can restructure, repackage, and re-IPO. Re so you take a uh, publicly traded company that, uh, that's in a bit of financial distress, uh, take it private, where they can develop a three- or four-year plan to restructure and reorganize. The market doesn't allow that kind of thing because every quarter you have to meet numbers. Sometimes being private allows you a lot more room to make long-term plans. Uh, and then once they uh, get their problem fixed, they can reintroduce them to the market later on in a new IPO re ipoing them early stage investments again uh, early stage VC it's the same as venture capital late stage this is pre IPO a lot of bridge financing here and bridge financing is when a company's at a certain stage and IPO is over here and they need some money just to get there in other words they need a bridge and that's what bridge financing is distressed debt uh, they'll buy debt that's selling well below its intrinsic value because when there's a problem, investors just run. They don't ask questions, and sometimes prices get to points where, look, yeah, it's a bad company, but come on, that price is way too low. So, some advantages of listed private equity. Number one, access to legitimate inside, inside information. So the management of the private equity firm has access to inside information. Now, it's legitimate inside information because they're holding companies that are not publicly traded. So they're allowed to trade on that inside information because they're not publicly traded companies. Let me give you an example. Let's say that I'm the owner of a private business uh, and I see a trend in my business that uh, the rest of the public doesn't see and I see something going on or some pending legislation coming that's going to affect my private business. Well, that's not inside information, even though nobody else knows about it. It's not pri um, uh, sorry inside information because I'm not publicly traded. So I can then decide, you know what I'm going to do? This legislation is going to hurt my private business. I'm going to put it up for sale now. Uh, well, I wouldn't be breaking any laws. I wouldn't be doing anything wrong. But if I own shares of a publicly traded company and I decided to sell my shares of the publicly traded company because I had that information, now I'm doing something wrong. I'm trading on inside information. That's illegal. So you have access to legitimate inside information since the target companies are private. And you have influence over management. Uh, there are no other shareholders to consider. You own the whole company. The disadvantages, well, you have illiquid investments. They're private investments. There's not a ready market. If you don't want to be in a particular business anymore, well, you've got to sell the whole business. Key personnel. Uh, the general partners of a private equity firm are usually the intellectual property. Uh, and they are mobile, which means they can leave and go to another firm, and they are mortal. They are mobile and mortal assets. Split shares. This is kind of a neat thing. Uh, I, I, I kind of like this, and you can, once you uh, understand the structure of a split share, you can conceive of almost any income-producing asset as a combination of an income stream and the value of the underlying asset, you can conceive of them as a split share as well. So let's see how we do this. Let's say that we see a stock, uh, ABC, share price $56, it pays a $2 dividend. That's a 3.57% yield. So an investment trust would come along and would buy shares of ABC and, and, and the investment trust would issue two securities. Now the investment trust owns nothing but ABC shares. But we would buy of the investment trust, we would either buy Trustco preferred shares or Trustco capital shares. The trust would sell these preferred shares at $25 a piece and pay them a dividend of $1.80. Remember now, ABC pays two bucks. It'll, it'll, it'll flow through to the preferred shareholders at $1.80, thereby giving the preferred shareholders a 7.2% 7 7 yield. This appeals to the income investor. For the common shares, it would sell them at $31. Now look at this. If you take the $25 and you add the 
you get the $56. So that's how they do this, is Trusco will buy one share of ABC, will issue a preferred share and a common share, the price of these two together buy that share, of the $2 that's, uh, that's uh, uh, um, earned uh, by the investment trust, 180 flows through to the preferred shareholders and the trust has the other 20, 20 cents. Uh, the common shares get all the capital gains of ABC. The preferred share will always be worth 25, will hold very, very close to 25. And as the price uh, of uh, ABC goes up, it all accrues to the common shares. That appeals to the growth investor. So let's look at an example of ABC goes to $62. If you bought it at 56 and it goes to 62, you made a 10.71% gain. But if you bought Trusco common shares instead, um, from 56 to 62 is a six dollar move well that six dollar move would happen all on the trusco common shares because the preferred shares stay at 25. so the common shares go from 31 to 37. you got a 19.35 percent gain so you can see that this really appeals to the growth investor whereas the preferred shares giving a 7.2 percent yield versus 3.57 really appeals to the income investor what are the risks here? Well, we got to look at the risks of the capital shares, which are the common shares, and we'll look at the risks of the preferred shares. The capital shares, you're using leverage uh, simply because you're not paying $56 of the price. You're paying $31 for a $56 stock. So you have leverage. There'll be more volatility. If the share price here moves 10% uh, up 560 or down 560, uh, if you figure out what 560 is a, of, uh, of $31, you're running uh, close to 16 to somewhere between 16 and 20% moves instead of 10%. So you have much higher volatility. If there's a dividend cut, if ABC decides to cut the dividend, well, this $1.80 to the preferred uh, has to be paid. So if they drop their dividend from $2 to $1.60, uh, well, then some of the shares of ABC that they hold will have to be sold to continue me continually meet this dividend. That's got to come out of the common shareholders uh, uh, and um, it will cause the, the price of ABC to drop. First of all, it will cause the price of ABC to drop. The capital shares take the whole hit. If preferred shares have a guaranteed dividend, shares will have to be sold. The preferred shares, early closing. If the net asset value of Trusco drops, it may wind up early. So if the net asset value of, of, of the company drops to at least 25 bucks, at 25 bucks, you got to shut it down. That wipes out all of the common shareholders and you're able to pay out the preferred shareholders at that point. So if net asset value truck drops may wind up early. Early redemption uh, is another risk of the preferred shares. Early redemption, of course, of Trusco, not of ABC. Reinvestment risk, if you're paid out early, well, now you have to reinvest. Here you're reinvesting at 7.2. You may have to reinvest in an era which offers a lower return. There's obviously credit risk, uh, simply because you have to, there's an investment trust uh, that has to have some sort of credit rating because the investment trust holds ABC. So you have to have some sort of uh, 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 belief that Trusco can meet its obligations. Decline in value of ABC. Well, it would have to decline a lot. It is a risk, yes, but that's a bigger risk for the capital shares because it would the, the ABC would have to go from 56 all the way to 25 before the preferred shares really start taking a hit. Uh, and, of course, dividend cuts. If there are dividend cuts uh, at the $2 level uh, and the uh, dividend on the Trusco preferred shares are not guaranteed, well, then the preferred shares may take a hit as well. Let's look at uh, asset-backed securities, and um, we'll walk through a, an example here uh, nice and slow because this, this tends to get a little bit confusing about, well, hang on a second now, wh wh who's backing the security? So let's have a look here. Let's say we have an originator. An originator could be uh, any company that originates the loan or that originates a receivable. So let's say it, the originator is a bank and the bank is making car loans. And after a while, the bank has sitting on its books a billion dollars in car loans that customers owe it. Uh, so it may say, well, you know, with this billion dollars, if, if we had that back, if everybody came in and paid off their car today, we could write another billion dollars worth of loans. So what they'll do is they'll sell this billion dollars worth of loans to another company called a special purpose vehicle, an SPV. And the SPV will then sell bonds, which are called asset-backed securities, will sell a billion dollars worth of bonds. And the bondholders pay the special purpose vehicle a billion dollars to hold the bonds. And the SPV then pays the bank the billion dollars. Now, the special purpose vehicle owns 
the uh, the car loans at this point. The bank no longer owns those car loans. The bank has been fully paid out. So the bank uh, makes more car loans. And when it gets to a billion dollars, it transfers the assets to an SPV. They sell more bonds. The bank gets its billion dollars, and it can make more car loans, on and on and on. You're probably thinking, but it doesn't earn any of the interest on the car loan. Ah, we're going to get to that. It does earn something. It still earns something. But what it gets when it writes those car loans is what are called origination fees. And origination fees are when you go get a car loan, uh, and let's say it's for $10,000, you don't owe the bank $10,000. You owe the bank a little bit more than $10,000. Those are called application fees and loan fees. Those are the fees they want to keep generating because that's money they can recognize as revenue today. The interest they can't recognize until they actually receive it years and years later. But it's those origination fees that are the big thing. So here are the assets sitting in the special purpose vehicle. The nice thing about this is the assets are now immune from origination failure, from the originator failure. So let's say this bank goes belly up. It's gone. Uh, well, the car loans would have belonged to all the debt holders of the bank, but since the car loans now belong to the special purpose vehicle, the bank can disappear completely and these things still survive. And the creditors of the bank cannot come to the special purpose vehicle and say, hey, 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 give us those car loans back. They now belong to the SPV. They belong to the bondholders. They're the collateral backing these bonds. And what does the investor get out of this? Gets all the income, less any fees of running the SPV. Well, what fees are there? There's something called a servicing fee. And here's how this works. I go to this bank. I get a car loan. The bank then sells my car loan to an SPV. I don't know that, though. I have no idea that that goes on. And from my perspective, I would never know because I continue to make my payments at the bank. The bank reaches into my bank account every month and takes out the car loan payment. Then they forward that money onto the SPV less their servicing fee. And the servicing fee is usually a percentage of the interest. So let's say that my car loan is 10%. Uh, and I pay the bank, the bank takes it out and takes 10% interest. They will forward on the principal payment to the SPV plus 8% interest, and the bank will still make 2% interest on money it doesn't even own. That's the beautiful, powerful thing about this for the bank is that they can make all these loans, charge all the origination fees, sell them off to an SPV, still collect the money from all of the customers it made loans to at 10% interest, keep two off the top and forward uh, the principal plus 8% to the SPV. The SPV now will then sell bonds that pay 6% interest so that the SPV retains 2% of that money themselves. The bank typically owns anywhere from 3 to 5% of the SPV. They own the equity piece of the SPV because there's a small equity piece. So if all these car loans pay off and all these people get paid off, there's still more money left here that belongs to the bank. Isn't that beautiful? Um, now, the asset-backed securities are not all equal. There's not just one class of bonds that are sold. There are three classes of bonds that are sold. There's a senior tranche. These are all called tranches. There's a senior that's typically rated either AA or AAA. It will have the lowest yield. So carrying on with our example, let's say the investor gets 6% on average. The senior tranche might get 3.5% because it's guaranteed it's got the highest rating. Then there'll be a mezzanine tranche, which will be rated lower at maybe A. And let's say that the average return here is 5%. And then you'll have a junior B tranche, which is the riskiest tranche to have. It'll have the highest yield. Let's say it has 9% yield. So the combination of these three might make 6%. And here's how this works. As payments come in, every time somebody makes a car payment, some of it will be principal, some of it will be interest. As the interest comes in, it pays the 9, it pays the 5, it pays the 3, but the principal, think of this as a jar. The principal flows into the jar like water and starts filling up from the bottom so that the senior tranche gets filled first. And as more principal comes in, the jar fills up. It fills up the mezzanine tranche. As more comes in, starts filling up. Oh, it stops right there. Why? Because maybe 4% of these car loans defaulted. So who suffers is the person who gets paid last. It is the riskiest tranche, the junior B tranche, but they're paid a higher yield to take on that risk. In fact, they might even all get paid off, with st and there still may be losses. Who covers that loss? It would be this 3 to 5% that's held in the SPV. 
that is there to absorb the first round of losses. So the bank would take the first round of losses. If this money disappears, then the junior B tranche takes the losses. Then it goes to mezzanine and then senior. But senior is probably 75 or 80 percent of the pool. You'd need 20 to 25 percent of these car loans failing completely before the senior tranche would be hurt, which isn't very likely. This whole process uh, is called securitization, the process of creating securities out of income producing assets. Uh, Asset-backed commercial paper is an example of this. It matches short-lived assets with short-term financing, uh, and it helps to avoid rollover risk. What, what, uh, what this is, is it's commercial paper, uh, but typically commercial paper is unsecured. This type of paper is asset-backed. There might be a receivable, let's say a big receivable that we know is coming in in six months, uh, but the company wants uh, cash for it now. So let's say the receivable is coming in in six months. The company can issue some commercial paper, which has a very low yield. Uh, if the company issuing it is rated uh, highly enough, it might be rated double A, which has a nice low yield on it. And it will be 180 day paper. Well, this receivable comes in in 180 days and just in time to meet the redemption of whatever uh, the maturity date of this is. When we say it avoids rollover risk, this is why. If it were if it were just, never mind the asset back, if it were just straight commercial paper, that's unsecured. There are no assets backing it. Let's say it's 180-day commercial paper. In 180 days, if the money is not there to meet that obligation, the company will issue another 180-day uh, uh, commercial paper uh, uh, issue to pay for this one. That's called rolling it over. Well, uh, if the asset that we've matched the financing with, again, that receivable, the money's coming in 180 days, it avoids the need for rollover. There's no rollover risk. We're gonna look at a mortgage-backed security, which is a special type of asset-backed security. If you understand asset-backed securities, you understand mortgage-backed securities. The only difference is the asset is a mortgage. That's all it is. So we have a pool of mortgages, and bonds are sold against this pool of mortgages. And the bonds receive monthly payments of interest plus principal, typically on the 15th of each month. Uh, these pool of mortgages are typically residential properties, single family, multifamily, social housing. Uh, they're fully insured by CMHC, the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation. Uh, all CMHC uh, insured MBS, mortgage-backed securities, trade in a secondary market and their return is typically greater than equal term government bond with equal risk. So they're fully insured by CMHC. Think about that for a second. That makes these almost risk-free securities. So these bonds are issued against a pool of almost risk-free securities. Mortgages are subject to prepayment risk. What does that mean? Well, I can go and I can get a 10-year mortgage or a five-year mortgage, but I can pay it off after two years. If interest rates drop and I can refinance at a lower rate, I can pay it off. Well, these bondholders now face the risk of getting paid back sooner than they might want to. So let's say that I'm an insurance company and I want a long-term investment, so I buy 10-year bonds that are backed by a pool of mortgages, but interest rates drop and a whole bunch of people pay off their bonds early or their mortgages early. I get paid out. I may only have bonds that, that mature in three and a half years, and I think, well, that's not what I wanted, though. I wanted 10-year bonds. That's called prepayment risk when interest rates drop. Mortgage holders tend to refinance at lower rates. So, in Canada, MBS are grouped into either open or closed MBS. So, take single family. Notice what I've done here with the type of residential property. Single family, and then you have multifamily and social housing. So, single family tend to be open MBS. Prepayments are allowed. The cash flow to the investor may include prepayment penalties. Typically, if you prepay your uh, mortgage early, you typically owe anywhere from two uh, to three months of interest, even though you're not, even though you don't have the loan anymore, that's your penalty. Two to three months of interest. Well, those penalties may flow through to the bondholders as a as a as a premium or a reward for taking on that prepayment risk. Multifamily social housing tend to be closed MBS, no prepayments allowed. And if we go past residential properties into commercial properties, you end up with something called a commercial mortgage-backed security, CMBS. In commercial, they are all closed. No prepayments. Let's just look at uh, some of the benefits and some of the risks on mortgage-backed securities. Benefits fully guaranteed by the Government of Canada as to principal. That's the CMHC, Canadian uh, uh, Mortgage and Housing Corporation. 
uh, fully guaranteed by the government of Canada as to principal, interest, and timing of payments when held to maturity. The CMHE guarantee does not limit the holding size. Guaranteed monthly payments are provided. Yields are higher than equivalent maturity government of Canada bonds. This is great uh, for long-term holders, pension funds, insurance companies, things like that, where they must hold a certain investment grade of bond and are trying to get a higher yield in government of Canada. This is a beautiful place to be. They are very liquid. Low minimum investment is required, usually $5,000. they are eligible to help be held within RSP, RRIF, or TFSA. I don't know so much about the RSP or TIF, uh, TFSA as a good, as a good holding uh, for uh, mortgage-backed securities because they tend to be very risk-free securities, uh, very, more about protection of principal uh, than growth or, or, or high income. Uh, but in an RRIF, they make a lot of sense. Risks, the prepayment possibility uh, uh, on uh, prepayable MBS introduces reinvestment risk. Now here's the problem with, uh, with this, and this is why this is a real thing. When are you going to get a whole bunch of prepayments? You're going to get a whole bunch of prepayments, if I draw this out and let's say that this is time and these are interest rates, if interest rates drop over time, well look at that, you're going to get a whole bunch of prepayments. So I'm going to get paid out of my bond right when interest rates are really low, so that when I go to reinvest in other bonds, guess what I'm getting? Low yields. So that sucks. Uh, if rates decline, it may not be possible to find the same attractive yield. Uh, for a prepayable MBS issue, increased uh, payments might be received when unscheduled payments are made by the borrowers. Uh, extra payments may also include bonuses or penalties. Both these situations reduce future interest payments. So, what is this saying? Um, here's the principal amount, uh, and here's time. And you can see that in the first month, my interest, or the interest, is charged on a very high amount of principal. But as time goes on, the principal drops at a very specific rate, unless there are prepayments. Then it drops like this. Well, the interest is charged on the outstanding balance. Notice the gap can start to widen over time so that the interest actually earned is on a lower and lower amount. So that's another risk as well. If a mortgage loan goes into default, all MBS investors may receive the full payment of the principal of the mortgage loan before the scheduled maturity date, which brings interest payments from that property to an end. I have a mortgage. I default on my mortgage. The bank comes, takes the house, sells it. Typically, uh, the security from the house more than pays for it, and CMHC steps in. So the bondholders are going to get paid out, but they're going to get paid out earlier than they want to. So whenever they receive that payment on the 15th, there's some of it that's principal, some of it's interest. The more principal they keep receiving next month, the lower the component of interest they're going to get because they have a bond that's deflating in value. Just to make sure you get this, let's say there's time, and let's say here's the value of the bond. You paid $1,000 for the bond. Uh, at the maturity date of your bond, it's worth zero because these are called fully amortizing bonds which means that every month you get a little bit of your principal back plus some interest. A little bit of your principal plus some interest. In conventional bonds, it's $1,000 all the way to maturity, and you get your $1,000 back in the future, so you're getting interest on the full $1,000 all the way through. But with these bonds, it does this. So halfway through, you're only getting interest on this amount. Over here, you're only getting interest on this amount. Well, what happens if it does this and ends early? because of prepayments. Notice that it's very hard to predict your cash flows in this for, for things like that. So that's a big risk with these things is that you have uncertain future cash flows. You don't know if you're going to get what you think you're going to get. If the mortgage property is damaged, legal action may result in liquidation of the loan from the uh, NHA MBS pool. It doesn't matter. You're still going to get the full amount, but you'll get it earlier than you would have liked to. Although MBS are liquid, a capital loss might be incurred when they are sold. If market rates have increased and there is still considerable time to maturity. Uh, so what does this mean? Well, it's still a bond. This has nothing to do with the underlying pool. It has to do with the bond. So you're holding the bond. Let's say you paid $1,000 for the bond. And the bond is fully amortizing, but let's say it has a coupon of 4.25%. And market interest rates are 4.25% at, uh, at the time that you bought it. And let's say that interest rates go up. Well, that's good for prepayment risk because no one will refinance when interest rates go up. But what do we know about bond prices when interest rates go up? Bond prices go down, $925. So if you need to sell your MBS, your bond before the maturity date, 
rising interest rates will lower the price. This is the risk of, uh, of, of any fixed income security.